Thank you. Mr. Vice President, Madam Speaker, Mr. Prime Minister, members of Lok Sabha and Raja Sabha, and most of all, the people of India, I thank you for the great honor of addressing the representatives of more than one billion Indians in the world's largest democracy. I bring the greetings and friendship of the world's oldest democracy, the United States of America, including nearly three million proud and patriotic Indian Americans. Uh, over the past three days, my wife Michelle and I have experienced the beauty and dynamism of India and its people. From the majesty of Humayun's tomb to the advanced technologies that are empowering farmers and women who are the backbone of Indian society. From the Diwali celebrations with school children to the innovators who are fueling India's economic rise. From the university students who will chart India's future to you, leaders who helped to bring India to this moment of extraordinary promise. At every stop, we have been welcomed with the hospitality for which Indians have always been known. So to you and the people of India, on behalf of me, Michelle, and the American people, please accept my deepest thanks. Bahut Danyava. Uh, I am not the first American president to visit India, nor will I be the last. But I am proud to visit India so early in my presidency. It's no coincidence that India is my first stop on a visit to Asia, or that this has been my longest visit to another country since becoming president. For in Asia and around the world, India is not simply emerging. India has emerged. And it is my firm belief that the relationship between the United States and India, bound by our shared interests and our shared values, will be one of the defining partnerships of the 21st century. This is the partnership that I've come here to build. This is the vision that our nations can realize together. My confidence in our shared future is grounded in my respect for India's treasured past, a civilization that's been shaping the world for thousands of years. Indians unlock the intricacies of the human body and the vastness of our universe. It's no exaggeration to say that our information age is rooted in Indian innovations, including the number zero. India, of course, India not only opened our minds, she expanded our moral imaginations with religious texts that still summon the faithful to lives of dignity and discipline, with poets who imagined a future where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. And with a man whose message of love and justice endures, the father of your nation, Mahatma Gandhi. For me and Michelle, this visit has therefore held special meaning. You see, throughout my life, including my work as a young man on behalf of the urban poor. I've always found inspiration in the life of Gandhiji and his simple and profound lesson 
to be the change we seek in the world. And just, just as he summoned Indians to seek their destiny, he influenced champions of equality in my own country, including a young preacher named Martin Luther King. After making his pil pilgrimage to India a half century ago, Dr. King called Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolent resistance the only logical and moral approach in the struggle for justice and progress. So we were honored to visit the residence where Gandhi and King both stayed, Mani Bhavu. And we were humbled to pay our respects at Raj Ghat. And I'm mindful that I might not be standing before you today as President of the United States had it not been for Gandhi and the message he shared and inspired with America and the world. An ancient civilization of science and innovation, a fundamental faith in human progress, this is the sturdy foundation upon which you have built ever since that stroke of midnight when the tricolor was raised over a free and independent India. And despite the skeptics who said this country was simply too poor or too vast or too diverse to succeed, you surmounted overwhelming odds and became a model to the world. Instead of slipping into starvation, you launched a green revolution that fed millions. Instead of becoming dependent on commodities and exports, you invested in science and technology and in your greatest resource, the Indian people. And the world sees the results, from the supercomputers you build to the Indian flag that you put on the moon. Instead of resisting the global economy, you became one of its engines, reforming the licensing Raj and unleashing an economic marvel that has lifted tens of millions of people from poverty and created one of the world's largest middle classes. Instead of succumbing to division, you have shown that the strength of India, the very idea of India, is its embrace of all colors all castes, all creeds. It's the diversity represented in this chamber today. It's the richness of faiths celebrated by a visitor to my hometown of Chicago more than a century ago, the renowned Swami, Vivakan Unda. He said that holiness, purity, and charity are not the exclusive possessions of any church in the world, and that every system has produced men and women of the most exalted character. And instead of being lured by the false notion that progress must come at the expense of freedom, you built the institutions upon which true democracy depends, free and fair elections, which enabled citizens to choose their own leaders without recourse to arms. An independent judiciary and the rule of law, which allows people to address their grievances. And a thriving free press and vibrant civil society, which allows every voice to be heard. This year, as India marks 60 years with a strong and democratic constitution, the lesson is clear. India has succeeded not in spite of democracy. India has succeeded because of democracy. Now, just as India has changed, so too has the relationship between our two nations. In the decades after independence, India advanced its interests as a proud leader of the non-aligned movement. Yet too often, the United States and India found ourselves on opposite sides of a north-south divide, estranged by a long Cold War. Those days are over. 
Here in India, two successive governments led by different parties have recognized that deeper partnership with America is both natural and necessary. And in the United States, both of my predecessors, one a Democrat, one a Republican, worked to bring us closer, leading to increased trade and allowing